So now the question is, can we figure out what the response is of a discrete time system to a causal input? And there's a couple of answers to this. The first one is to say, of course, it's what we've been doing up until now. You use something like Z transforms to figure it out. So as an example, if you feed an input X of N into an arbitrary discrete time system, I'm going to draw it as H of Z. But if you prefer to see it as a DTFT, you can just replace that Z with a E to the J omega. You know you'll get some sort of output. There's different ways you can do this. If H of N is finite, you could convolve the input with the H of N to find the output. You can do that directly. If H of Z or if H of N is infinitely long, like it's been my previous examples, you can't convolve because you need to convolve with something infinitely long and that doesn't work. So instead, you'd work in the Z domain or in the DTFT, you'd work in the frequency domain. And as an example, you'd figure out what your Y of Z is. You'd say convolution in one domain is equal to multiplication in the other. So you'd multiply the X of Z by the H of Z. And then you'd take the inverse Z transform of your Y of Z to find your Y of N. And the typical way you take that inverse Z transform is you'd check to see if it's proper. If it's not proper, you'd divide. And then once it's proper, you'd find its partial fraction decomposition. And then you just recognize the parts right off the table. So that's the simple method to do it. There's a second method too, and it uses approximation. Sometimes you, approximation is no good, in which case you've got to use method one. But if it's okay to have an approximate answer, you can get that approximate answer with far, far less work by saying the response to a causal input is probably going to be pretty close to the response to a steady state input. Because whatever is different than the two will quickly decay after time equals zero. And soon you'll be left with a response to the steady state input. Let me talk about this more. I know everybody likes examples. So let me give an example of what I'm talking about. Let's say our input is e to the j3n times u of n. We know that this is a causal input because it's multiplied by this u of n. And for that very reason, it means that the output is not going to be a steady state response because the input isn't a steady state input. In general, the output is in fact going to be the sum of two parts. It's going to be the steady state output, the response to the input if it didn't have that u of n times it, plus some sort of transiently decaying, that word is transient, some sort of transient decaying output that will quickly go to zero. Now, the steady state response we calculated just before in my review. We said you can calculate that by just evaluating your h of e to the j omega at omega naught. So that's the omega naught associated with this particular value, which here would be three. And then to that, we'll have to add the y transient. And what I'm telling you is that the y transient will quickly decay down to zero. How fast will it decay down to zero? Let's answer that question. So we want to talk about what the transient part of the output looks like, because we can find that the steady state part of the output is easy to calculate, like we did in the previous page. So if we can talk about what the Y transient part looks like, we can perhaps say we can ignore it entirely if it looks small and just use this approximation. And instead of having to do a whole Z transform and inverse Z transform and partial fraction decomposition, we can now very quickly just substitute in H of E to the J omega, instantly find out our Y of it, our Y steady state and be done with the whole problem, even though this is just an approximation. So how good would an approximation be of saying our whole response to a causal input is just the same as the steady state response, which is the same thing as saying, how good is an approximation to say our Y transient response is pretty close to zero. And to answer that, we need to look at what our transfer function really means. So you'll remember from our last class 
that a transfer function is just another way to write the difference equation for our system. So in other words, our difference equation is a bunch of coefficients times our current input and previous inputs from K goes from zero, that would be our current input to capital M, that would be M units behind our current input. And that equals a sum of current and past outputs where K equals zero is our current output and K equals capital N is our nth previous output. Now, if this is true, and it is, then we can rewrite our transfer function, our H of Z, as just a ratio of polynomials. And there's a ratio in, in the denominator from K equals zero to capital N of all of our output coefficients, B sub K times Z to the minus K. And then our numerator, it would be a ratio of our input coefficients from K equals zero to capital M of a sub k z to the minus k. Let me get a little more room here by just putting our output is equal to the steady state output plus the transient output and just pushing it over on our left a little bit. Now there's something special that happens here when n equals zero. You'll recall that our filter order is what we call our n. And if our filter order, our n, is equal to zero, what that means down here, if n is equal to zero, is that our denominator just becomes b sub zero times z to the zero, z to the zero is one. And so our whole denominator just becomes one number, b sub zero. And if we divide top and bottom by b sub zero, it means our denominator becomes one and it just goes away. In other words, if our filter order is zero, our whole denominator here goes away and our transfer function is just the numerator portion. What that means in our difference equation is that our current output is not a function of past outputs. Our current output is just a function of current and past inputs. And think about what that means for our impulse response. We're talking about an n equals zero filter order. Then there's a whole bunch of things that happen. It means our current output is only a function of current and past inputs, not a function of past outputs. And this means that it has a finite length impulse response. If you kick the dog, if you put in an impulse at n equals zero, because the current output, the impulse response, your impulse in, is only a function of current and past inputs, it will only be non-zero for a finite length of time. How long? M plus one samples long. Take a look at what this equation becomes. If capital N is zero, then what you're saying is that the current output is just equal to A sub zero times X sub zero times your current input. What it means is that your current output is a function of your current input, scaled by A naught, plus your previous input, scaled by A1, and so on, up to M samples ago of your input, scaled by A sub M. So it's only gonna pick up, your current output is only gonna pick up your current input back to your M samples ago of your current input. And after that, it's not gonna pick it up. So your impulse response will only last between zero and M samples, which is, what we, which is what we wrote here. It's the same thing as saying that there's no feedback. It's the same thing as saying the denominator, denominator of H of Z is one. I mean, it could be any constant, right? And then we could just divide the top and bottom by that constant. So it's equivalent to having a denominator of H of Z equal to one. So all those things are, are important. But the biggest thing to realize is that because your h of n is only non-zero between n equals zero and capital M, that means that you can now place some limits on how long y transient of n exists. And it goes, it's non-zero from zero to strictly less than M. And that means that the total output is equal to the steady state output 
for n greater than or equal to capital M. And that is the end result, is that if you're looking at a finite impulse filter, then your output is equal to the steady state value for any values of n greater than capital M. And that means that instead of having to do this difficult thing to the left about taking Z transforms of the input, Z transforms of the system, multiplying them, taking inverse Z transforms by using partial diffraction de decomposition, which you can do on paper, but it's very difficult to do in a microcontroller. All of a sudden you can approximate the output as being the steady state response, which is what we did on this previous page right here. So if you've got a cosine input or a power series input, even if it's causal, if it's going into a finite impulse response filter, the output is going to be equal to the steady state response for n greater than m. And that's different. It's going to be exactly equal to it. And that's different than, and that's different than if n is greater than zero. If n is greater than zero, then the output is a function of past outputs as well as inputs. And once it's a function of past outputs, then there is feedback. And that means it's an infinite impulse response. And well, from now on, we'll just call that IIR rather than writing the whole thing out. And that's the same thing as saying H of Z's denominator is not equal to one. It's something And that's the same thing as saying that the transient portion of the output is going to be infinitely long, although it does decay. So there's no point at which the output is exactly equal to the steady state output. But after a, an arbitrarily long period of time, it gets arbitrarily close.